Welcome to Bottled Petrichor, a podcast dedicated to discussing key topics in Islamic history and thought. In addition to a short lecture at the start of most episodes, we ask our guest experts questions submitted by listeners and allow them to share their thoughts in a safe environment. Please visit our Twitter page for feedback and question submission forms. Thank you, and I hope you enjoy. Welcome to Bottled Petrichor podcast. I'm very pleased to have on Dr. Sean Anthony today. Hello, doctor. How are you? Hi, how are you doing? Doing just fine. Thanks for inviting me. Yes, of course. I, like uh, many of the listeners here, have benefited from your work and your very insightful Twitter threads. Uh, so I'm really excited about this conversation. Yeah, uh, me too. <laughs> okay, I just wanted to <laughs> directly move in and just ask you to introduce yourself. What got you interested in the field? Uh, what are some of your major um, works, your research interests? Um. So I guess I could, my name is Sean Anthony. Uh, I am a native of Ohio where I grew up and now I end up working. That was a big surprise as I didn't do that on purpose. Um, but in general, I would introduce myself as a, an Arabist and a historian of the early Islamic period. I'm basically interested in any, and I guess I would extend it to late antiquity too, but mostly the early Islamic period, which I would define approximately to the first kind of two centuries after Hijra. So the uh, the 8th and the uh, 9th centuries and also the uh, the 7th century, 6th uh, century, basically that period. I'm interested in just about anything uh, related to that. Um, I did my dissertation on uh, a legend about the origins of Shiism associated with a figure named Ibn Saba. And so the story is that where's the Shiism come from? It was a, a plot by uh, a Jewish guy from Yemen that wanted revenge against uh, the early Muslim community. And I've kind of moved on from that, but I still do a lot of Shiism stuff. I wrote a monograph on the history of crucifixion from the, the late Roman, uh, late Sistanian period into the Islamic period. Uh, and I also do a lot of kind of work in Arabic and Arabic translation. I'm a uh, editor of uh, the Library of Arabic Literature series, where we kind of publish uh, volumes that are half Arabic text and the other with accompanying uh, English translation. Uh, my first one I did for that was the Kitab Mahazi, or the Expeditions of uh, Muhammad ibn Rashid, one of the earliest biographies of Muhammad to survive. It dates uh, from the 7th century. Uh, sorry, just six hundred. I always mess up the <laughs> the numbers. It dates from the eighth century, uh, and uh, I'm in. Oh, I've just finished the translation and edition of uh, one, the earliest surviving biography of the Umayyad Caliph Omar ibn Abdul Aziz. So I'm going to be finishing that off, and uh, I also just published a book called Muhammad and the Empires of Faith, uh, in which I kind of lay out. Uh, my approach and what I hope will be uh, a kind of a way of moving forward for those who do kind of academic history of early of Islam, uh, of writing, thinking about uh, the historical Muhammad and uh, all the early literature that is written about his life, either directly or indirectly or incidentally. Thank you. And I will be sure to include a link to uh, your recent publication um, wherever I post this. I'm going to move right along and ask if you could just outline for us the major events, dates in the life of the Prophet mm -hmm. and how Sira is different or similar to Hadith and how other fields in Islamic studies interact with the Sira. Mm. So when it comes to thinking with kind of the, the Sira literature, uh, I like to call it the Sira Mahazi literature because it's called the Mahazi literature be before it's called the Sira literature. Um, but uh, so I'll be calling it Mahazi most of the time just as a, as a reflex. Uh, but so one of the things that's interesting about this literature, even though it's written by multiple generations, is it has a more or less set historical schema, by which I mean you have a series of events that serve as the main chronological nodes around which all the events and stories tend to be organized and categorized, right? And this is systematized pretty early on, particularly for the Menina period of the Prophet Muhammad's life. And so that we're talking about between the year 622 and 632, so the first 10 years after the Hijra, right? So if you look at that, uh, our earliest uh, folks to compile a biography of the Prophet Muhammad 
in the eighth century. These are uh, that are systematic and complete are probably people like Ibn Ishaq, Musa ibn Uqba, Abu Ma'ashir al Sindi. All of these folks, we really only have uh, bits and fragments that survive, but we have the largest amount, the largest corpus from Ibn Ishaq. They more or less agree uh, in unanimity that there are in uh, the Medinan period kind of 25 Ghazawat or expeditions around which the Medinan period can be organized. All right, so these are the really famous ones like Badr Ahad, Al Khandaq, Khaybar, the conquest of Mecca, uh, Hunayn, and Ta'if. These are uh, kind of the battles and engagements that happen after the peaceful conquest of Mecca. And then they usually have around 50 Ba'ufa Sarayya. These are uh, sort of expeditions that are sent out or kind of smaller raids that are sent out by the Prophet Muhammad for tr- strategic reasons. And they also agree uh, that of uh, the 25 ex- main expeditions that uh, uh, that are undertaken in the Medinian period, uh, Muhammad fought on the battlefield of at least nine of them. Sometimes that number goes up and down. So we, we have a general broad consensus of what that looks like. Uh, and beginning with Ibn Ishaq, if we go earlier to the Meccan period of, uh, of the Prophet Muhammad's life, uh, we again see... Uh, the same events are being mentioned, okay? So we'll think, you think about the, we'll go with the basics. The birth of the Prophet Muhammad, I mean, everyone has to be born. Uh, in general, there's a consensus that he uh, lived into his 60s, okay? So that puts his at birth user around 569, 570. And then we have kind of event, major events that are in the early history of Mecca before the, pro, the Prophet is called to his mission uh, and receives his first revelation. These are things like uh, the War of Sacrilege. Okay, so this is a war during one of the sacred months. Uh, his marriage to Khadija, uh, the building of the Kaaba, the, the building of the Kaaba in the form that it was during the time of the Prophet Muhammad, not its its first time. Uh, the story goes that uh, a woman was uh, uh, kind of setting a fire nearby the Kaaba, and some of the flames uh, kind of burned it down, so it had to be rebuilt. And so that's kind of a key moment, a key story in, in the life of the Prophet Muhammad as well. And then we have his call to be his pro- uh, the Prophet or the Messenger. It's called the Mab'ath, and that usually is put around when he's 40 years old. Uh, and then his the beginning of his open preaching in Mecca, usually around 43 years old. And then we have his, uh, his Hijra uh, to Medina, fleeing the persecution of the pagan Meccans uh, who opposed him, his message, and uh, tried to stem the uh, the influence of his followers. Uh, so that happens when he's around 53 years old. That's uh, a pretty good date, I think, too, that's well established that we can determine uh, historically, too, and that's, that's 622. So oh, around that, though, you, you tend to get a, a lot of differences, uh, sp- uh, particularly if you kind of look at uh, the Syria literature as um something that accumulates over multiple generations okay so what we can think about the generations is represented by kind of a seminal figure that has particular authority these folks are almost always medinan they almost always lived and, and grew up in the city of medina and studied with kind of the great scholars of medina uh probably our earliest person who whom we have a real good sense of uh uh, his traditions and some of the things that he said about the life of the Prophet Muhammad is probably Arwa ibn al-Zubair. He's the, uh, he's the son of one of the most famous companions of the Prophet. He is a nephew of uh, one of the most famous wives of the Prophet, Aisha bint Abi Bakr. Uh, but we don't really get a lot of chronological information from him, even though we do get some. The person to really put a, a robust chronological order to these events is uh, one of his students, kind of a subsequent generation, uh, a guy by the name of Ibn Shahab Zuhri, uh, who is a Medinan and also had uh, intense connections with uh, and intimate connections with the Umayyad court and Damascus. And we kind of get our first sense of how these events are ordered. And then after him, you get Ibn Ishaq. Uh, we, that gives us a different ordering and dates and, and things like that. Uh, and then you get, I, with Ibn Ishaq, I think you get the generation of people that begin to establish consensus. At least there were people like Musa ibn Uqba, Abu Ma'ashir al-Sindi, and things like that. And then under, uh, uh, following them is a generation 
uh, of, of under Harun Rashid and things like this. So this is the early uh, 9th century folks like al uh or it's kind of like the final layer that's added to this whole corpus. I think one of the main questions we ask is, how do these things differ between one another? How do the generations differ? Uh, the example I always like to give is the question of uh, what happened the year the prophet was born. Okay, so the thing that you usually read, and whether it be Sunday school or your typical introduction to the life of the prophet Muhammad, or um, even the encyclopedia article or lecture and kind of the survey course is that the prophet muhammad was born in 570 of the common era and this score corresponds with a year called Am al fil all right or the year of the elephant in which a uh, a ruler of uh, of southern arabia of yemen marched against mecca with the elephant troop and divine intervention stopped the elephant troop from raising the kaaba uh, to the ground and destroying Mecca and conquering Mecca. Interesting thing is, is that this um, kind of coupling of the date of Muhammad's birth with the year of the elephant, uh, as far as uh, I can tell at least, does not predate the writings of Ibn Ishaq in terms of the Mahazi material. If you look at his teacher, Ibn Shahab Zuhri, who writes in the Umayyad period, Ibn Ishaq more or less writes in the early Abbasid period. So this is, uh, Abbasid period begins in 750. Uh, Ibn Shahab Zuhri dies in 742. Okay, So he dies eight years before the Abbasids take over. If you read Ibn Shahab Zuhri's material, um, he actually says that the year of, ele- of the elephant happened long before the Prophet Muhammad was even born. All right? So... He says it happened 70 years before the Mab'ath, or 70 years before the Prophet Muhammad was called to be a prophet. This doesn't mean, for, in Zuhri's view, that the Prophet Muhammad was uh, 70 year, years old when Gabriel first appeared to him, but rather he just thinks it happens long before the Prophet Muhammad was born. In fact, uh, Zuhri places the year of the elephant uh, during the time in which the Prophet Muhammad's grandfather was still just a young man. All right, so uh, what happens as time progresses is that the older layers tend to be put to the side, even for someone that's a giant authority like Ibn Shahab Zuhri, and tends to be replaced with the basic scheme that either Ibn Ishaq or al waqidi puts in place. And there's a bunch of reasons for that. Uh, but to, to make it kind of short, I think what happens is you get historical bottlenecks. Right? You have bottlenecks, and by which I mean you have uh, sort of only certain passages through which knowledge pa- uh, passes on from generation to generation. Right? And so if you want to know this information, then you go to XYZ sources, right? Uh, and the interesting thing is, is even figures that, say, have doubts or regard Ibn Ishaq's authority as being dubious as a muhaddith, as a hadith transmitter, say someone like al-Bukhari, will none of us use his schemes, right, his, his chronological schemes. So if you look at the, the Kitab al-Maghazi of al-Bukhari, which is an amazing kind of subsection of this Sahih, of his kind of collection of the authentic traditions of the Prophet Muhammad, um, it's, it's an amazing exercise in kind of circumventing Ibn Ishaq's Maghazi, which precedes Bukhari's text, right? Uh, he never cites his traditions directly, but he does constantly reference Ibn Ishaq as an authority for kind of the general structure of the historiography of Muhammad's life. So in terms of the actual reports, no, but in terms of, say, the science of like tarikh, right, of assigning dates, of organizing things in a chronographic structure, he still is very important. And one of the layers that is also subsequently added to this, that's oftentimes forgotten, but I think new attention is being paid to this again, is the role of Kind of astrologers and also assigning um, sort of important dates and kind of canonizing certain dates as important and as significant. And you, you'll get this from other historians like uh, like Ibn Wadih al Yaqubi in his tarikh. Not only for every uh, kind of major event and every major ruler, he'll he'll kind of provide some horoscopy go along with their biography. It'll tell you under what sign they were born, what was the astral array, what does it tell you about them, etc. 
And these kind of methods begin to be used to also kind of regularize and give sort of a, a scientific feel to the, uh, the, uh, the chronography of, uh, of the life of the Prophet Muhammad. Thank you for that. And I think we're going to be touching upon a lot of what you said throughout this episode. And so I'm just going to move on and ask, is there any documentary evidence that we have from the Prophet's life? Uh, mm-hmm. really? uh, and what methodological tools are used to determine what's true and what's not, if, the, yeah. if there is documentary evidence? Yeah. So for something to really count as documentary evidence, uh, the, to the highest degree, then we would actually have an, an artifact that we know kind of definitely comes from, say, his lifetime or very shortly thereafter, right? So in terms of that type of artifact, the only thing that I think that we have enough evidence to say, yes, this is kind of documentary evidence for the existence of of the Prophet Muhammad's life is uh, the Quran. And and I I may sound a little bit glib uh, to say that, but one of the things that has been uh, I think transformative in recent decades, and I think a monumental change, has been that uh, uh, there has been this kind of renewed interest in the material history of the early Arabic text of the scripture of the Quran, right? And a lot of times people associate this with the discovery of ancient Quran manuscripts in the Grand Mosque of Sana, Yemen. Uh, what, what a lot of people have forgotten, however, is that this discovery occurred in 1972. So I, I don't know, Asher, what, when, what year you were born, but it was, disco- it was discovered before I was born, okay? So a lot of times we, we tend to think that this is all very recent and cutting edge and stuff like that. In many ways, there, there has been recent cutting edge research, but it took a while to really uh, catch on. The actual changes to the field and how we view the Quran as kind of the primeval document of early Muslim religiosity and kind of the most reliable record of the Prophet Muhammad's message, right? Uh, this, that was kind of four decades in the making, really. If, if Four decades, particularly if you kind of count from 1972, when the first discovery happened, to I think probably the most important uh, publication on that, and that's Bahnam Sadagi and Muslim Godarazi's study, uh, you know, we're talking about, you know, decades of work. And so not only do we have, uh, so what happens in those decades, I should say, uh, well, for one, we have finally the application of radiocarbon dating, right? Uh, but what's often forgotten that, and it kind of strengthens the radiocarbon dating and actually makes it more precise and more useful actually for historical uh, reasons is the new breakthroughs in Arabic paleography, um, particularly as discovered by folks like Francois de Roche and his students, also folks like Alba Fedeli. I mean, you can name the names. Uh, it's a very exciting field. And so what those discoveries did is they confirm uh, against the very skeptical views uh, by kind of those who would be acolytes to say Wandsboro that would see the the canonization and the compilation of the Quran being very late, say in the 8th century, uh, what it is, it got rid of those views. It showed that they're basically they're, in, sorry to put it so bluntly, a waste of time, right? And because the material evidence had not properly been um, examined to the degree that, that, that it ought to have been. But what it is, it confirmed that the Quran does date to the lifetime of Muhammad's followers, right? Uh, and I think that these discoveries have renewed, at least I hope it has renewed, uh, uh, the mandate to undertake kind of comparative readings of the Quran as a document of Arabia and against the backdrop of the kind of the epistemic fabric of the late antiquity, or just might say more simply the backdrop of the kind of religious and intellectual changes that were afoot in Arabia in the broader Near East from the sixth, the seventh centuries, okay? So there's that, there's the Quran, which I think is a, a massively undersold document. Um, I'm, I'm not trying to also preclude uh, other theories out there that that, uh, that perhaps some of your listeners might be s- sympathetic to. Like, like it's to me, it's still very possible, the jury's still out, like whether or not there are parts of the Quran that are older than, uh, than the Prophet Muhammad's lifetime or something like that. I'm not trying to get like too... Uh, kind of aggressive against kind of religious faith or the claims of religious faith. Uh, but 
re regardless of, of whether or not that's ever even actually knowable or discoverable, I think the idea that, that the Quran as we have it, right, is this primeval document of, of Muslim religiosity and dates to the Prophet Muhammad's lifetime, I think is is extremely well established. And I, if you want to kind of go against that view, which I think is now the consensus, you have to bring very high caliber evidence. And I don't see that high caliber evidence currently out there being provided. And that would topple such a view. Um, but beyond that, there are other things that are outside the Quran. Okay, so uh, one of the most interesting documents is uh, probably the, the earliest document to mention uh, the Prophet Muhammad's name. He doesn't call him a prophet, doesn't know that he's that he's a prophet or, or anything like that. Uh, but it does it mentions his followers and the conquests of his followers in uh, Palestine and Syria. Right? And this is this very early uh, text written in Syriac, and it's written on what's called the fly sheet of uh, a gospel manuscript. So a fly sheet is that blank piece of paper that you see when you open up a book. All right. So what someone did, maybe a monk, someone literate, um, they kind of had observed or somehow encountered the events leading up to and following the Battle of Yarmouk. And they make a very clear statement that there were kind of attacks in the countryside by conquerors uh, that they call Tayoye, which is Syriac for kind of Arabs. Uh, and they mention that we, we kind of find in this kind of text uh, that mentioned the defeat of the Romans and, and all other stuff. And uh, we also find mention of, of the Prophet Muhammad's name. And it's spelled an Arabic equivalent would be Mim Wal Hadal. That's it's, but of course it's in Syriac, non-Arabic. Uh, so, but it's it's very easy to see, even though the state of the preservation of the sheet is uh, not very good. Uh, it's, I mean, it's extraordinarily early text, uh, and so it dates to right around 636 CE. To give you an idea, so we're we're talking about less than a decade after the death of the Prophet Muhammad, according to the traditional date in 632. Okay, so it, it's very, very early. It's probably the earliest document we have. Um, we have other texts like that, the non-Christian texts as well. Uh, some of the more extraordinary ones, uh, in my view, just the name one, uh, is an Armenian chronicle by a figure who we call Pseudosabios. We call him Pseudosabios because older scholarship uh, misidentify him with uh, um, with a bishop by the name of Sabios. We don't really know who who wrote it, but we know that he he completed his chronicle uh, right after the end of the El Fitna Kubra or the first kind of civil war. Uh, so basically, the chronicle takes us up to uh, uh, the reign of Muawiyah, and he knows quite a great deal about the Prophet Muhammad, the uh, the early conquests. He doesn't know that he's called a prophet, but he does know that he's called a lawmaker. He lists several laws that appear in the Quran or regulations. Uh, he gets them right. Uh, they're easily found in the Quranic text itself. And even though he's writing from Armenia, which seems pretty far away, he himself claims that he receives the testimony, the information that he records in his book from, uh, from refugees from Palestine that are kind of fleeing the conquest. And so we have the sense of he's dealing with very early sources. You know, it's it's really quite extraordinary uh, that we have this type of evidence even available. Uh, I mean, there's nothing remotely comparable uh, to this type of early evidence for other kind of so-called founders of religion, right? There's you know, Abraham, there is no historical evidence for him. He is, Abraham is not, we, the way I like to put it, and I don't want this to be taken uh, in the wrong way, Abraham is not a figure of history. He's a figure of, of memory, right? There's no historical evidence for him. There's only the evidence of the memory of of the early Hebrews, Israelites, and Jews that wrote about him in the Bible, but we have no historical evidence for him. The same thing goes for Moses. No historical evidence for Moses. He's a figure of memory, not a figure of history. Uh, we get a little bit different with Jesus, right? Uh, but and uh, like there, but a lot of the evidence for uh, uh, for Jesus' existence is, is quite poor. They, we have the testimony of, uh, of uh, Josephus, uh, but 
again, that's not nearly as close to uh, uh, to the life of Jesus as this type of evidence. And we certainly don't have nearly as many words uh, that uh, that Jesus of Nazareth uttered as we do on the scale of something like the Quran. Uh, it maybe. Maybe someone like Paul would be the closest thing you would have, and we actually have his letters and things in the in the language that he composed and things like that. Uh, but the evidence for the historical existence of Muhammad in terms of the documented record, I think, is very robust. Understood. And I think I'm I'm going to follow up this a bit later. Uh, but before we get there, you had mentioned some of the major um, authors of the Malazi works, but I just wanted to ask again. Who were the major authors of the Maghazi work and how do we of the works and how how have their works come down to us? Um, so there's Maghazi that ha, are reported to ex, who have existed that are now lost and then the ones that survive. And so we're able to speak about the ones that survive through various means with a bit more certainty. Uh, but th- as far as we can tell, at least if we're to believe uh, people like Ibn and Deem, so booksellers of Baghdad that make these very kind of long lists of um, uh, of books and their titles and things like that. And there's really no reason that he necessarily made them up. Uh, Marazi was a very popular genre that many people contributed to, right? The earliest reported collection of Marazi traditions was actually undertaken um, under the patronage of the Umayyad Caliphs. The first mention that we have is a guy named Aban ibn Athman ibn Affan, and he died somewhere between 719 and 723. Um, so he's the he's the son of the third caliph, Uthman ibn Affan, the one who commissioned the collection of the Quran as well. And he purportedly col- uh, collected a work uh, at the behest of the Umayyad prince Suleiman ibn Abd al-Malik. Now that doesn't survive at all. It was supposedly ordered to be burnt by. Uh, Suleiman's father, Abd al-Malik ibn Rawan, who was the caliph at the time, because he got upset that it said too many nice things about the Ansar of Medina. The Ansar of Medina are the two tribes that occupied uh, Medina or Yathrib, the Aus and Hazraj, before uh, the Prophet Muhammad undertook his hijra there in 622, and who supported him uh, uh, throughout his, his life and and kind of l- and basically aided his success uh, to uh, kind of spread Islam and to kind of take over Arabia. So in any case, but when we really start actually getting evidence, right, of things that survive fragmentary works that can be attributed to people with some degree of certainty, a varying degree, then we have to begin with Arwa ibn al-Zubair. So he dies in 711, 713, thereabouts. And so we have letters that are attributed to him. We have uh, reports that are attributed to him. And a lot of recent research uh, into these reports uh, seem to suggest that these actually really do uh, go to him. So he's he's the generate he's a son of a very prominent companion of, of the Prophet Muhammad, but he himself did not uh, ever meet the Prophet uh, Muhammad. He met he met people who personally knew the Prophet Muhammad. Uh, however, I think the the best evidence uh, that we have is for the uh, recording and written compilation of traditions by a figure named Ibn Jahab Zuhri. Uh, now, his stuff mostly survives in fragments and other texts, uh, but we do have some major texts that can kind of compile his Mahazi traditions, like uh, the Mahazi of Ma'amad ibn Rashid, which I kind of re-edited and I translated for the Library of Arabic Literature. It mostly relies upon traditions from Zuhri, uh, and we have other people that transmit from him as well. And this gives us an idea of what the biography of the Prophet Muhammad looked like in the late Umayyad period. We call the Marwanid period, so before 744 and after 690, basically. Um, uh, but by far, in terms of the uh, written evidence and the surviving materials, the most important authors are three students of Az-Zuhri. Uh, and these are Ma'amar ibn Rashid, whose material survived, we said before, Musa ibn Uqba, uh, whose uh, material does not survive independently, but is quoted extensively uh, by later authors, and I think his text can reasonably be reconstructed. At least we get a sense of what it contained, even though we don't know what it looked like on its own. And above all, Muhammad ibn Ishaq, who died uh, in 767. Muhammad ibn Ishaq is kind of the the giant of the genre, right? So, oh, and one of the things that 
to kind of keep in mind about uh, about the genre itself is that while a lot of a lot of it kind of lays out uh, what kind of Shahab Ahmed calls this moral historical epic of early Islam, um, a large part of, of the genre is dedicated to providing kind of this systematic chronography, a tarikh of the events of the Prophet's life, and on the one hand, but on the other hand, all of human history, right? So the the Mahazi literature is really the beginning of Arabic historical writing. So, or by the way of putting it, writing history in Arabic. So Ibn Ishaq's original text begins with literally the creation of the world, and it ends with the caliphate. All right, so it, it's a very kind of uh, epic, expansive genre. All right, even though it's called Mahazi, referring to primarily the, uh, the expeditions of the Prophet Muhammad, and that title is kind of more what we call a pars pro toto, right? It's a title that you take uh, a part of the work that's considered to be its heart, its beating heart, its most important part, and you use that part as the title for the whole. But really, it's very, it's a very ambitious work. Right? It does pre-Islamic history, it does primordial human history. It's sort of a a roadmap for understanding. Uh, God's providential plan for humanity up until, you know, the time of the Abbasid Caliphate. And uh, it kind of views human history as reaching its climax with the coming of the Prophet Muhammad and the founding of his ummah, his community. Uh, from these works, which which of them are considered to be most authentic, uh, most dependable, most mm-hmm. reliable by later Muslim scholars and, I mean, across all fields? Yeah. So the reliability of the Mahazi tradition uh, is is interesting. So when we say reliability, a lot of times what folks are kind of referring to is kind of the array of authentication methods employed by um, Hadith folk, so the Hadith critics. And one of the things to keep in mind, although there are a lot of folks that uh, – Kind of both participated in kind of the creation of the Mahazi genre and also were muhaddathun or they transmitted hadith. The standards that they use for including material in their works uh, could be vastly different. Uh, and one of the reasons why it's particularly challenging to talk about this is, for one, uh, oftentimes the standards of later hadith critics are anachronistically back projected onto the earliest generations. And so it is in, in under this assumption that they kind of thought about the transmission tradition that way. For the most part, they did not. And on the, on the other hand, you have this sense that they're, they're doing different projects, okay? That is, the Mahazi people are doing different projects than the Hadith folk. So in general, if you look at someone like a Belletris, like al Jahaz, he will talk about two ways of having uh, – uh, so al-Jahaz is, is – just for those who don't know, al-Jahaz is kind of a, a central kind of keystone figure of early Arabic letters. And he's also a uh, one, of the, one of the more brilliant uh, kind of theologians of the early uh, Mu'atazila. When he thinks about, for example, uh, authentic history or whatever, he thinks about in terms of reliable reports that are transmitted by trustworthy people. Right. Uh, on the one hand. And on the other hand, we'll also talk about poems and poetry. Right. So what you don't get so much of in a lot of the Hadith literature is reams of poetry. Right. But what you get a lot of uh, in Mahazi literature is reams of poetry. You get a lot of poetry. Um, so sometimes these things are, are used to authenticate or to kind of add a little bit of historical argumentation to accounts and things like that. And sometimes they're they're there merely for, uh, like to kind of spice things up for entertainment. Uh, But in general, what we do find is that the later Hadith critics, like say, Al-Bukhari, Muslim, like kind of these kind of giants, you know, uh, uh, they do not view uh, the Mahazi literature as kind of reaching their standards. Always, right? So they rely upon them for chronology. They rely upon them for understanding how the life of the Prophet Muhammad is, is understood. 
but they don't necessarily accept all their reports as 100% authentic according to their standards, right? Uh, now, if we ask the question of like how authentic are these things from say a modern historical critical perspective, and that's that's a whole kind of different kind of can of worms that we can open. Um, and in general, you know how how a story is is told and how it's attested and how kind of we get evidence for it uh, is uh, well it it's something that kind of works in gradations, right? Rather than, uh, we, we kind of have our, we don't have our Sahih and our, you know, Mursul and all this other stuff, but we, we do have kind of our, our other methods. The idea is the, the things in which you have the most evidence for, uh, and at the earliest date, right? And, uh, and the most different types of evidence for, pretend to be considered to be the most uh, reliably authentic. So, like for me, as as a historian working with different methods than than say al Hadith, for me I would say something like the the Hijra of Muhammad from Mecca to Medina is a highly authentic event. It definitely happened, and in order to establish that fact, I would I would talk about the convergence both of narrative literary sources right, uh, and material evidence, in particular in uh, material evidence that, for example, uses the Hijra calendar. And then also I could talk about non-Muslim sources that attest to uh, the usage of the Hijri calendar and the kind of founding of uh, uh, the city-state in Medina by the Prophet Muhammad, even earlier than the Arabic literary sources, right? So we have multiple sorts of evidence that do not conspire and have no uh, kind of ideological need to harmonize their claims all converging and agreeing on a single kind of historicity of an event. So it's a very strong level of historicity. I, I mean, what percentage of, of events uh, that are in these various works would you say are, according to you, um, you know, something that actually did occur? Oh, <laughs> um, you know, a lot of that stuff, uh, when it comes to what I would put my money down on, uh, the ones that are directly mentioned or referenced in the Quran are the ones that, to me, are the strongest. I, now, that that's a bit of a broad claim, and when you actually kind of zoom in on it and scrutinize it, a lot of things uh, will, will might kind of fall to the side. But so I'll give you an example: something like Badr, something like Ahad, the Battle of Hunain, um, kind of the conflicts with. The Qurayza and the Nadir, I think, are very historical. Um, but, you know, when it comes to the other things, then we get a bit more messy, right? If we want to talk about specific events, right, uh, versus ger generalities. I mean, pro one of the things that gives one pause, at least gives me pause as historians, is the, high, the highly schematized nature of, of the literary genre. And, and to me, that means that there is a, a kind of historic graphical filter, okay, that there is sort of a, a way of presenting the events that is established and is going through a single conduit. So what do I mean by that? So if I were to ask you, um, I don't know, say right now to write your personal biography, it would, you would name certain events, right? And when I would come back to you 20 years from now and I would ask you to write your personal biography, you would name certain events, right? Uh, and then when I'd ask maybe some after you passed away, God forbid, one of your friends to write your biography, they would name certain events, right? What you would unlikely get is for the biography that you wrote today and the biography that you would write 20 years ago and the biography of your friend post-mortem to name all of the same events, right? That doesn't mean the events didn't happen, but that would mean that there is um, – sort of schemes that are being followed that uh, kind of tend to self-perpetuate. There's kind of a curriculum, if you will. Uh, and it doesn't mean there's a conspiracy or, or, or anything like that. It just, it just means that these schemes are in place and there's kind of a school of thought and, and we're not kind of getting uh, kind of outside perspectives. Okay. And I mean, this is, this actually has some pretty interesting consequences for uh, how we date the serial literature and how we know 
uh, that it dates, uh, a lot of its scheme date to a pretty early period. I'll give you a kind of a quick example. So um, one of the kind of the most creative scholars that unfortunately is no longer publishing uh, anymore, but he's uh, still alive, is uh, this guy by the name of Lawrence Conrad. And he did a very interesting study of the early history of the life of the Prophet Muhammad in a Greek chronicle of a Byzantine historian named Theophanes the Confessor. And he went through and he noticed it had all sorts of really interesting information about Khadija, had interesting information about uh, the genealogy of the Prophet Muhammad, his Nasab. And it, conf it conformed, you know, almost pitch perfect with what you find in works like that of, you know, Muhammad ibn Ishaq, right? And so one of the things that, uh, and before Theophanes writes this, we don't have anything like this, uh, this sort of one-to-one -one correspondence between the non-Muslim material and the Muslim material. And what Conrad was able to show is that this actually marks one of our kind of earliest instances in which early Arabic historical writing and kind of the Greek historiographical tradition, particularly the, uh, the late Roman, kind of intersect with one another. There's this cross-pollination, right, where there's all of a sudden they're reading uh, one another in some way. Well, at least the Greeks, the folks writing in Greek are you relying on Eastern sources, some of which are, are Muslim, right? So, I mean, we can figure things out like that, but, um, you know, it's, it's hard to kind of confirm and to kind of attribute a high degree of certainty to, that, to those things. But also I should say that despite those reservations, it's also uh, the other side of the coin is, is true too. Even though you can't increase the certainty that those schemata are correct, we also don't really have a lot of information that they're wrong either, okay? So the only time that you, you get something like that is one of the examples that I cited early on, uh, where Azuhri sees uh, the uh, year of the elephant is not corresponding to uh, the year in which the Prophet Muhammad was born, right? But rather he puts the year of, ele of the elephant as happening 70 years before the Prophet Muhammad was called to be you know, the messenger of God. Uh, and, but Ibn Ishaq, his student, changes that. He places the birth of the Prophet and uh, the year of the elephant in the same year, right? What changed? Why did that happen? Why did that change occur? You know, like those are the types of questions we can ask. But in the places where Azuhri agrees with Ibn Ishaq or Musa ibn Uqba and all this other stuff, right? There's no way of knowing if, it, it, there's no way of either falsifying it or in, say increasing its confirmation per se. Understood. And this kind of, kind of leads us to this next question. What are some of the major problems with the Maghazi literature? Uh, to what extent has uh, this literature been influenced by other material? And um, how did this material evolve in, you know, sectarian, uh, in sectarian settings or in response to various conflicts? Mm -hmm. And it's kind of a mouthful there, but. Yeah. Uh, so, I mean, there's, there's a lot of problems, <laughs> but I would say that um, in general, it's, it, the problems that affect most historiographical genres in general, right? Um, in even histories that are, say, a biography of, of Lincoln and, and things like that. So, um, well, I guess one, one kind of faint, one easy example that's kind of right uh, in front of everybody in current times is to think about Christopher Columbus, right? So if you think about uh, Christopher Columbus and how the perceptions of who he was and the quality of his character has changed over time. You might ask, like, why? What, what was going on with that? Like, so why is it that, say, my father or my grandfather would have been instructed in school that he was some sort of hero, right, and would have glorified him? Uh, where, where did they get this idea from? Well, where did this kind of glorification of Christopher Columbus come from? Uh, and where... Uh, and what kind of instituted or inspired the change to where now folks of my generation, probably your generation, I assume, 
have a pretty negative view of Christopher Columbus. How, do, how does that change? Did, did our historical knowledge of Christopher Columbus change? In some ways it did, so there's a little bit problematic example because a new documents were found. Uh, but one of the ways in which we can answer that question is just say, well, where did where does kind of the legend of Christopher Columbus and kind of the popular imagination come from? Well, most of it comes from, at least in the American context, to a work written by Washington Irving of Rumble, Rumble uh, not Rumble Still Skin, um, what's the guy that sleeps forever? Um, Rip Van Winkle fame, thank you. Um, he also wrote a biography of the Prophet Muhammad, by the way, Washington Irving did. Uh, he's one of the earliest American authors. He wrote a very popular a biography of Christopher Columbus that uh, accounts for most of its uh, most of the myths surrounding Christopher Columbus and his lionization in American culture and American imagination. Right. So when we think about how historians kind of encounter Christopher Columbus and try to reevaluate this figure, they're always are going to have to tangle with and deal with sort of the uh, the consequences of the popularity of Washington Irving's account. Okay, uh, and the same thing is similar to uh, uh, how we look at the serial literature. Even though I, I don't think that uh, there's going to be this huge kind of turn away from the Prophet Muhammad, of course, like we have with Christopher Columbus for obvious reasons. He's the founder of a major world religion and kind of the, the worldview and the morality and kind of spirituality of, of billions of people around the world and will continue to be so in, for a very, very long time. Uh, but we are dealing with uh, literary portrayals that are meant to be literary, are meant to be entertaining, uh, and that are designed to compete for the attention of the elite, okay? So well, I, what do I mean by that? So when I, when you imagine kind of the literate elite, particularly of like, say, the caliphal court or the court of, say, the viziers, and particularly in the Abbasid period, they had at their disposal a wide range of literature uh, about uh, the stories of past kings, of wise men, uh, of poems uh, of kind of, uh, of of kind of varying degree of quality some of them are quite uh, ingenious uh, but some of them just ribald and, and low taste and also uh, musical compositions and things like that and it was a market in which people were competing for the ruler's attention and so in the Sirah Mahazi literature was written to more or less beat out all this other stuff okay it was meant to be a literary genre that could go toe to toe with, say, the stories of the Persian kings, the Shah Nome, for example, or the stories of the kind of exploits of Alexander the Great, or uh, you know the poems of Imre Kais, right? Uh, and the idea was, if we have this great literary genre that extols the virtues, uh, the uh, achievements and kind of the glories of the Prophet Muhammad and his early followers, uh, then people will watch this, right? Or not watch this, will listen to this, right? So instead of, uh, you can imagine in, in some a similar context, you know, you have to, uh, when you want people's eyeballs and attention, you have to kind of compete with, you know, with Netflix, with Hulu, with Amazon Prime, whatever, um, that they're, they're interested in. And somehow you have to grab their attention. And so, Part of this uh, process of, of creating uh, a literary genre that also serves as kind of our main conduit for historical knowledge uh, means that there that you, there's a loss there, right? Uh, and narrative does this anyway. I mean, anytime you you, you take uh, uh, you know just random collection of facts and you start drawing something into a narrative, you start, you start to make an argument, you start to create a view of the world, uh, you start to make uh, kind of moral claims about uh, history and what events are, uh, the past, I should say, what events are important, which ones aren't, and things like that. And so it, it's just by virtue of the process of creating a narrative, uh, you simultaneously kind of create a conduit for thinking about the past and using the past, but you also create a, a barrier to knowing the past as well, because you always close off certain certain kind of ways of accessing the path, and that's one of the reasons why historians are uh, 
are keen to find new things, right? Where we use different methods. How can we get around the literary narratives? How, what, what can we see that has been excluded, suppressed, whatever, by the literary narratives? Well, that's why we like material evidence and, and things like that. Understood. And what was like, what was the knowledge of the prophet's life like in the early periods among scholars and lay people? Was it always romanticized? How much of the events of his life did people on average know, even scholars? Um, as far as I can tell, uh, the early Muslims knew very little about the Prophet Muhammad's life. Um, and there's, and it's a, it's, it may sound surprising to say, but in general, we have to remember, one, we have very kind of low rates of literacy. Uh, and we have also kind of the experience of Islam of, of everyday people is mostly takes place in a communal context of prayer and kind of in ritual kind of participation in the community uh, in in the main cities, right? So this, we're mostly talking about the very early prison. And in general, one of the things that's interesting is you have in an actual opposition on behalf of some of the rulers to see uh, the knowledge about the life of the Prophet Muhammad and his early companions to be widespread uh, for fear of kind of the dissent uh, and um, um, what's the other word? Uh, maybe just dissent, dissension, and kind of uh, uprisings that might result uh, from it. Um, so, <laughs> like, what? It's, it's hard to know how much we should take this very seriously. But you take some, something like the Umayyads, right, where you have all these stories about all the bad things that Abu Sufyan did during the lifetime of the Prophet Abu Sufyan being kind of one of the main progenitor of uh, the early Umayyad caliphs, the Sufyanids at least. And so some people might say, you know, Abu Sufyan was a bad guy. Look at all these bad things he did. Why in the world is Muawiyah bin Abu Sufyan leading us and, and things like this? Um, and so you had an idea that, well, we don't really want people reading this material, okay? Uh, on the other hand, we have uh, a sense that you know, some stories were very popular and were told very widely. And we have people that were professionally employed to tell the stories over and over again. Uh, one of the examples I talk about uh, in my book is the story of a, of a cause, sorry, of a, of a preacher in Mecca that was patronized by the Zubairids to tell the Iqra story. So this is the famous story where the Prophet Muhammad uh, is uh, in, the, in a cave uh, on Mount Hira and the angel Gabriel appears and tells him to read or in the name of his Lord. And so uh, according to a lot of historical reports, this story was told to everyone that came to Mecca and uh, the public mosque. And uh, it was disseminated when people were going on Hajj and with the Hajj caravans and, and things like that. Uh, and then on the other hand, to give you another anecdote to make it even more confusing, uh, so I don't necessarily think this anecdote is, is 100% true. I think some, some folks that are Hanafis will maybe be a little bit offended by this anecdote, and I apologize uh, uh, beforehand. But according to a funny story, uh, to be funny, sorry, uh, about Abu Hanifa and Abu Yusuf al-Qadi, one of his most important students. Uh, Abu, so I should say that Abu Yusuf al-Qadi didn't just study under Abu Hanifa, the founder of the Hanafi madhab. He also studied uh, Maghazi with uh, Muhammad ibn Ishaq. Right? So Muhammad ibn Ishaq and Abu Hanifa were both his, uh, his uh, uh, teachers. So as the story goes, uh, Abu Yusuf comes to Abu Hanifa's uh, teaching circle, having just left Ibn Ishaq's teaching circle. And Abu Hanifa kind of takes umbrage that Abu Yusuf is wasting his time with Ibn Ishaq. He should be studying fiqh with Abu Hanifa, right? So he kind of chides him for this. And then Abu Yusuf gets a little bit uppity towards Abu Hanifa and he says, he tells him, he says, watch out or else I'll ask you which battle came first, Uhud or Badr. I think I'm getting the story right. I might mess that up, but I think that's how it goes. And the, the um, implication was that Abu Hanifa did not know which battle came first, which sounds absolutely extraordinary, right? Like that someone of 
an indisputably kind of uh, giant status is Abu Hanifa would not know that Badr came before Ahad, right, and not vice versa, right? Uh, I said it's probably an exaggerated story, uh, but you do get a sense that uh, people had specializations, and even some of what uh, the most knowledgeable scholars who uh, whose knowledge far exceeds anything you or I will ever be able to do achieve. Uh, didn't know what we seem to think as as basics. Uh, uh, Malik ibn Anas was widely said to be not very good at Mirazi. He himself never wrote a Mirazi book, uh, and he was a famous opponent of Ibn Ishaq. But you know, I don't think people had uh, a systematic knowledge of Muhammad's life. They probably had an anecdotal knowledge of him at most, and. I think that they knew that he was the prophet, and they revered him, and they hoped for uh, his shifa, and they hoped for his uh, intercession as the prophet of, his, of the community and in the afterlife and things like that. Uh, and they saw him as the as the uh, messenger who delivered the Quran, and and revered him and loved him uh, as much as the religion uh, uh, required uh, them, but. Didn't necessarily, but they didn't necessarily have a, a very systematic understanding of of how his life unfolded. Really fascinating, mm-hmm. and one wonders about the. I guess you touched upon this, but the priorities amongst the early Muslims in mm-hmm. in discussing the Prophet. I know that later on, uh, or it might be. I mean, this is probably from the get go, but there's this emphasis on uh, loving the Prophet more than you love yourself mm-hmm. uh, and your family. Uh, and I'm not saying this that loving somebody requires you to know everything about that person's life, mm-hmm. but yeah. um, I mean, I guess in addition to well, what we were just talking. Well, let me ask you: like, could you could you write me a biography of your mother and father? Personally, no. I probably. Yeah, I mean, I could write. Something. Yeah, it's, yeah. I, I, there's a lot of details I wouldn't like. I, I don't. You know, it's 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 is these these are odd things, right? This is systematic knowledge, right? This is like memory versus actual historical information, things like that. That's. Yeah. Absolutely. And so I wonder, I mean, kind of uh, going off that, uh, an emphasis over the role that the prophet plays not only in life, but also in um, in your relationship with God. As that develops, do we see a change also in kind of the, the material uh, surrounding the life of the prophet and some of the stuff that's talked about? Uh, yeah, so so one of the major things that happens that, um, uh, that I really don't touch upon uh, – because it it's kind of opens up a whole new arena, is the emergence of uh, popular literature in Arabic and popular biographies of the Prophet Muhammad. So we do eventually have uh, kind of this big corpus of literature that is for popular consumption, it's for religious instruction, and the Prophet Muhammad features as like the main character. And a lot of this literature is absolutely despised by the muhaddathun, but we know is extraordinarily popular. It's very well attested in the manuscript record. And a lot of it tends to be read, uh, for example, in the mulid ceremonies and things like that. Most of it, it seems to appear out of the Fatimid period, Uh, but it spreads very far and wide. But we also get movements like the Karamiya that have kind of big texts that are and a very popular for teaching people who Muhammad is. Uh, well, one of these that's probably the most famous is uh, uh, the Thousand and One Questions of Abdullah bin Salam al Yahudi. Uh, so Abdullah bin Salam is the one of the earliest converts to Islam. He's a, uh, uh, who is a Jew, uh, uh, and so basically this text. Uh, Abdullah bin Salam tests the Prophet Muhammad's knowledge and asks him every question that you could possibly imagine, cosmological, eschatological, you know, biological, you name it. He's testing him for everything. And of course, every question that Abdullah bin Salam uh, asks the Prophet Muhammad, you know, it's a home run when the Prophet Muhammad answers the question. And it's just everything's like, mashallah, greatest hits, right? And one of the things that's really interesting is that the text uh, – Asks about all these amazing things, but it also provides very simple, easy to consume answers. And if you kind of follow the history of that text, uh, it's very widespread in manuscripts. We find that we find the manuscripts in, in, uh, in what from West Africa basically all the way to Malaysia into the, the Malaysian archipelago, in, in many many different languages. And matter of fact, it, when you when the Europeans 
began, to, well, I won't necessarily call them Europeans at that point, when the Latins, I should say, uh, began to translate works from Arabic that were of a religious nature, they translated the Quran and they translated this a thousand questions of Abdullah bin Salam. They called it the Doctrine of Muhammad. So it's these very po these popular texts were everywhere and very important, and they were not part of sort of the scholarly repertoire that someone like Ibn Hajj al Asqalani would would uh, revere, uh, or is definitely not the type of text that you see sort of the Salafi movement uh, is showing a lot of interest in, but they are hugely important. Uh, and so that's kind of the way in which people experience the Prophet Muhammad. And in, in those texts, I mean, we have superhuman elements of Muhammad uh, in Ibn Ishaq's uh, text already, uh, you know, doing miracles and all sorts of things like that. But in those types of texts, Muhammad is, is not just a human figure, a historical figure around whom or through whom miracles occur, mostly around whom, but rather he is a cosmic figure. He's a figure of light. He's a figure from whom the whole universe is created. All right? it, it's, he's, he's extraordinarily uh, kind of expanded at that point. Understood. And you touched upon this, but I just wanted to ask again, uh, the, scholarly, the, the, the scholarly class, if they wanted to... Uh, if they needed to reference some event about the life of the prophet, or uh, maybe you know if they're writing in the 10th or 11th or 12th centuries, what would they use? They would use Ibn Ishaq. I mean, uh, almost always. Even, this happens as early as a Shafi'i, who you know, basically there's no, there's not really anyone else to use. So, so there's a problem that occurs for the Medinans, uh, in which uh, the Medinans basically. Uh, reject Ibn Ishaq because there's this huge nasty feud between Ibn Ishaq and Malik ibn Anas, right? And Malik ibn Anas refuses to allow his students to rely upon Ibn Ishaq's Mahazi, and so they need an alternative, and that alternative is Musa ibn Uqba. But if you look at kind of the history of uh, sort of what Malikis write about the life of uh, the Prophet Muhammad, like if you look at Al Qadiyyad, Shifa, and things like that, they inevitably have to use Ibn Ishaq. He becomes this really important bottleneck uh, for, for everyone. And so Ibn Ishaq is uh, he's, he's unavoidable. There are attempts to sort of get around his corpus. Like uh, uh, you see this, uh, like we talked about the example earlier of like, uh, Bukhari. Uh, making a whole kitab in Mahazi that kind of gets around most most of what Ibn Ishaq does. Uh, but in general, uh, you know, for the basic chronology of the Prophet Muhammad's life, it's Ibn Ishaq, and then after Ibn Ishaq, it's, it's Al-Waqidi. Thank you. And so just before we move on to this next set of questions, uh, you had mentioned that the Quran is something of an immense amount of value uh, in the study of the life of the Prophet. So is that the Quran just as a Quran, or do scholars also rely upon, uh, you know, the Asbab Nuzul or uh, different, you know, Tafsir literature? Because I think the, the Prophet's name is mentioned perhaps four times in the Quran. Mm -hmm. uh, without, of course, to these other um, uh, fields, how, how exactly would we know what what verse talks about the life of the Prophet and maybe not something else? Yeah. So. <coughs> Particularly when so we're talking asbab and nuzul and all this other stuff uh, is not really from kind of my perspective something that should be readily in the toolkit of this of the historian per se. Okay, especially when thinking about the Quran historically. Uh, but in order to think through the Quran historically, uh, one first has to take the step of of asking the question of well. Um, what parts of the Quran were written first, what parts of the Quran were written later. And this is where we begin to get into one of, I think, one of the thorniest and most difficult uh, debates that are currently go, uh, going on in kind of the field and how we think about reading the Quran as a historical text. So the method is more or less to put the tafsir and the, and the claims of the tafsir and other genres like, you know, Nasakh and Mansukh literature, so on the abrogated and abrogating verses in the Quran, or Asbab and Nuzul, which is really quite a late genre, in which you, it's late, by which I mean it's late uh, when you get works with this title being written. 
uh, and look at the internal characteristics of the Quran and look at the internal characteristics of surahs and try to see if you can rearrange them in a chronological order. Right. So there are folks that believe that, no, you can't do this. Uh, it's just the the process of editing and compiling the Quran rendered it impossible to differentiate the chronological kind of strata within the Quran. And we just have the text as it is. And we have the tafsir literature and asbab and nuzul. And that's unreliable. We can't really trust it. You know, that's one view. Perhaps I'm not really giving its full justice. But and the other view is, is that one can carefully uh, examine the sources and kind of rearrange them in chronological order uh, based on internal criteria, not relying upon the sira, uh, not relying upon asbab and uzul literature. Sometimes what uh, there might be correspondences, but these are theoretically at least accidental, right? They're happy accidents, but accidental nonetheless, okay? Um, in Currently, kind of the main proponents of, of that are folks like Angelica Neuvert and Nikolai Sinai uh, and kind of the Corpus Chronicum folks. Uh, and it's a revision of the old uh, version of kind of Nuldaki's chronology, and it's a revision, which is in turn a revision of Suyuti's chronology from the Muslim tradition. Um, and basically, the idea is that we have kind of four main chronological layers of the Quran that one can reliably discern based upon internal criteria uh, to the Quranic sources themselves and the languages and the verses and stuff that they contain. And then we call that Mecca 1, Mecca 2, Mecca 3, and Medina. So we have three kind of uh, Meccan periods, early, middle, late, and then you have the Medinan period. And theoretically, you could write a type of biography. It would look very different than, say, a Montgomery Watt type biography of Muhammad, uh, but you can write a type of biography uh, textually by thinking about how the Quranic message changes and is revised from, you know, the first Meccan period, the second Meccan period, the third Meccan period, and finally the Medinian period. All right, so it, it'll be a a type of, of biography, but it'll, it will, will, will not look uh, like a traditional one or kind of just be, say, uh, the Syria literature rephrased in, um, you know, modern parlance or kind of a modern kind of academic idiom. It will look more like a uh, kind of a textual analysis of, of the Quranic corpus and how the Quranic corpus corpus expanse. Okay. How were the events in the life of the Prophet, as depicted in this uh, Sira Maghazi literature, used polemically by uh, Christians or Jews? So the first thing that had to happen uh, before that was possible is that the Christians and Jews had to have access to the Sira Maghazi literature. All right. So when the, the first question is, when did that happen? So when did Christians and Jews, uh, mostly we're talking about Christians, Jewish literature in this regard is, is uh, for the early period, is very kind of thin. It was not, not a lot survives, mostly apocalyptic literature. But so let's, we'll stick with the Christians for, like, say, the first two centuries. So when did this actually happen? When did this act of kind of cross-pollination happen? So it happens uh, pretty late, actually. Uh, probably our earliest examples and, and our most famous examples of this happen with um, John. Of, well, so one of the claims I make in my book, I don't know if anyone else has done this. I, I claim that uh, John of Damascus actually has some access. I'm not sure how much access, but he has some knowledge of, of the Sira Mahazi accounts of the life of the Prophet Muhammad uh, because of one statement that he says. Uh, and that statement is, that the Prophet Muhammad received his revelations in his sleep. Okay, and so that doesn't appear in the Quran um, explicitly, at least, uh, but it does explicitly occur in the Iqra story. So when the angel Gabriel appears before the Prophet Muhammad and gives him the command to read, it says that it happens fi minamihi. So it was while he was asleep. It was a it was a ru'ya asadqa, or is a supernatural dream that he had while he was in his sleep. He also saw him, of course, while he's waking, but according to the account, that happened while he was, he was asleep. Uh, so that's our first hint. And then our next hint after that 
um, is um, probably the the work of Theophanes that we talked about earlier, right? And so to give you a quick example of how it was used uh, polemically, um, so early Muslim literature, for the most part, uh, it, this might sound a little bit controversial because it's kind of an axiom nowadays, uh, but but I argue, at least in my book, does not call Muhammad a, a, a traitor, but the early Christian literature does. And so eventually what happens when Theophanes comes along and he knows about Khadija and Khadija's relationship with the prophet Muhammad, he basically uses this to construct a view of the prophet Muhammad as one being a slave or a, of servile origins for Muhammad. So he comes from a lowly background and it, they use his, his trading circuit and his trading to kind of explain how he learned or gained knowledge about uh, the stories of Moses and Jesus, the Torah, etc., cetera, uh, during his travels, right, which definitely doesn't occur in this era. But they use that kind of basic sphere information in order to kind of launch a polemic. Another famous example that happens, and most of these uh, these kind of very influential examples probably uh, were written down during the reign of Al-Ma'mun. So we're talking about in the early 9th century. And this is a time in which there's a massive exchange of knowledge between the Byzantine and uh, the Abbasid worlds. We have two very influential works that, uh, that are written by Christians. One of them is called the Bahira Apocalypse. And, and this is the and the other one is, is called the Apology of El Kindi. So um, the Bahira Apocalypse is, in essence, a, an apocalyptic text that contains with it a story about how a monk gave the Quran to the prophet Muhammad and kind of taught him everything. And then Jews came along and corrupted it then messed it up. Right. So there's that. So clearly they seem to uh, either rely upon or merge uh, a earlier Christian polemic with the story, the Bahira story that you find in this hawk. The Bahira story being the story of when uh, the Prophet Muhammad travels with his uncle to Bosra in southern Syria and a Christian monk named Bahira, uh, which in Syria just means renowned, um, sees the Prophet Muhammad as a young boy and foretells his future greatness. It's it's a story that's modeled on the story of the Prophet Samuel recognizing the young David and his future glory in, in the Bible. Uh, in any case, that's kind of used to Say like, oh, this is where he kind of got the Quran from. He got it from this monk. And the other one that's that's probably the most interesting one of all in terms of the reception history of, uh, of the Syria literature is this apology of El Kindi. It's a it's a pseudo uh, uh, pseudo pigraphal account. That is, it's 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 a, it's written under a pseudonym, I should say. So uh, it's supposedly written as an as an exchange between a Christian Arab and a Muslim Arab. And it likely dates to the reign of Al Ma'mun, and it's one of the kind of most vehement and strident, and I would imagine for Muslims di most difficult to read uh, polemics against the Prophet Muhammad, and it relies almost exclusively on the Nahazi of Ibn Ishaq. And matter of fact, it's a very early testimony to the reception history of Ibn Ishaq's Nahazi. He knows the text very well, and he kind of constructs his polemical narrative and his kind of criticisms of Muhammad and what he considers to be an expose of his claims of prophecy uh, based upon his reading of, of Ibn Ishaq in large part. Understood. Yeah, I had a uh, Syriac final and... Um... Uh, we had to translate, uh, I think, portions of the of the uh, Christian Bahira legend, and it was, it was super fascinating. Yeah, it really is. Very, it's a very interesting text, and the history of how it actually was compiled and all that stuff is quite complex. Uh, Barbara Rogamina has uh, Rogamina, maybe I said her name wrong. Um, sound funny when I said it. Um, has written an excellent excellent study on it. Um, uh, that I highly recommend. So it's translated to English, all its different versions, uh, has multiple versions in Syriac, Arabic, and Latin. So. Yeah, I, I did a thread on it. Maybe I'll retweet it. Um, yeah. But um, so just kind of in line with some of this other stuff, uh, in, in in shaping the character of the prophet, uh, even amongst kind of these earlier uh, biographers, would do we see Christian uh, or Jewish motifs? And if we do, 
what's the purpose? Is it uh, is it because the assumed audience might be composed of Christians and Jews, or was there some type of authority or legitimacy to be drawn from shaping a character kind of in line with that? Yeah. So if we look at the serial literature in general, I mean, and its stories, they draw upon, I would say, two genres that preceded it to to a very large extent in addition to poetry and all that stuff, but we just, we'll just talk about the kind of the narrative sections um so there is a very strong tendency to cast uh the prophet muhammad and his life and also the life of his companions in the mode and model of biblical figures okay so this sometimes is very explicit in so far as uh, specific verses and passages from the Bible are translated to Arabic and included within the literature. That uh, article on the quotation from the Gospel of John is like a very famous example. There's also famous examples from the book of Isaiah and, and the Torah and things like that. Uh, so there's there's that. But really what I mean is something that's a bit more subtle and you kind of have to know your Bible uh, pretty well to really see it. And these are instances in which uh, the stories in the Sierra Mahazi literature actually recapitulate and re-narrate stories that occur in the Bible, but they locate it in the life of the Prophet Muhammad without explicitly saying that they're from the Bible. So, And this doesn't only happen with biblical stories. It also happens with hagiography so, and martyrology. So martyrologies and hagiographies are two very kind of popular uh, genres in late antiquity before the rise of Islam, and they continue to be after the rise of Islam. These are essentially lives of saints and holy people and people who kind of gave their lives for uh, their beliefs or were killed for their beliefs. Um, we see kind of stories that uh, are told about monks and holy women and martyrs uh, basically being retold, but with a new cast of character uh, characters and with kind of uh, more uh, Quranic and, and Muslim sensibilities in mind in the early Sarah and the Hazi literature. Uh, there's tons of examples of this, but um, before I kind of give you a specific example, I just want to kind of answer the question of why, why do they do this? So one of the reasons is, is that when it's, we're talking about a literary genre, a literary genre that has conventions, Right, a literary genre that has expectations, and a literary genre that uh, kind of had kind of set that expectations in its audience already. And so, one of the examples I I often cite is uh, how kind of romantic comedies tend to work nowadays. So, if you go in, you're going to watch a romantic comedy. You kind of know a lot of the tropes that are going to appear in the narrative, right? So, their first you know, you, the uh, the two people that are going to fall in love are going to hate each other, right? And then they fall in love, right? And it's great. And then they have an argument and they split up. And you think that they're not going to get together. But then by the movie's end, some kind of dramatic events happen and they're together and then roll credits, right? It's just, it's something that you, it's a formula that you've seen again and again and again because it, and it kind of reflects our uh, views of what romantic relationships should be like, right? You, it's very different than, say, for example, the Adri or the chase poetry of the Umayyad period where, you know, boy meets girl, boy never gets to be with girl, he dies. <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it's different uh, from time to time, but hagiography and martyrology also works according to very similar themes, and they draw upon the Bible and one another and things like that. So, uh, very a quick example. So, when we have the story of uh, Bahira recognizing uh, the Prophet Muhammad, as I said before, this is very clearly modeled on the biblical story of the Prophet Samuel uh, recognizing David among the sons of Jesse. Okay, uh, there are other aspects too that have uh, of David's life that have often been seen to kind of play a role in the construction of, of Muhammad's life. Uh, same thing with the life of Moses and things like that. Uh, but I think one thing that's been less uh, attended to is the way in which uh, certain episodes from the Prophet Muhammad's life are um, preceded by hagiography. So famous examples of this are the story of the splitting uh, 
of the Prophet Muhammad's chest and the washing of his heart. All right, we have stories that occur like this about monks uh, in the Egyptian desert. Uh, also, like sort of the story of uh, the camel choosing the spot for the Prophet's mosque to be constructed in Medina. Um, we have a very similar story about the construction of a martyrology of an Egyptian saint. Uh, and then we can even go to, say, the Iqra story, where uh, the angel appears to the Prophet Muhammad at night. And while he is uh, separated from his... Uh, uh, kind of family in his town on on the kind of the outskirts of uh, of the city, right? Uh, so this is a scene that happens again and again and again in hagiography. Um, probably there's very famous examples of this. Probably the one from the Near East is the most famous example is the story of Romanos the Melodist, uh, which I discuss in my book. Uh, but Interestingly enough, it's a very common – it's a story that even appears uh, about the uh, earliest poet of, uh, of English verse, uh, Kedmon, in the works of the, uh, the Honorable Bede. Uh, and he's more or less – and that's from the same century as uh, which uh, the Prophet Muhammad lived. So you have these kind of motifs that we find in world literature and that kind of serve as – uh, sort of the ingredients to kind of make these stories into a literary genre in order to kind of meet the expectations of what a holy person ought to look like, what a holy person ought to do, right? Uh, of course, holy people see angels. Uh, you know, of course, holy people, uh, you know, you know, pray a lot because that's just what holy people do, right? That this kind of goes into the expectations of of how they're going to be characterized, right? So a lot of these things are are top boy or tropes they're kind of literary conventions that uh uh kind of fill out uh our kind of visions of them as kind of pious heroes understood and, and you also mentioned uh numbers uh astrology how, how does this all fit into the the, the, the biography <clears throat> so um they're basically when it comes to astrology uh, well, really, is astronomy and astrology, you know, same thing. Uh, it's it's seen as a well, it really it very much was a scientific way of keeping time. All right. So if you want to know what the future is going to look like and what the past looks like, you can apply mathematical model, uh, models to the kind of observed phenomenon of the kind of the astral plane right what you see in the stars and you can predict you know where heavenly bodies are going to be using these models and so the idea the basic assumption is behind a lot of the historiography that employs uh kind of astronomy astrology etc is that uh you can actually determine precisely when events happened because uh when particularly important events like the birth of kings prophets etc uh, because there will be some sort of special uh, array in the sky when that event occurs, right? And this is a very important theme across multiple cultures, right? Uh, and you get this in the story of the birth of Jesus in the typical nativity account, right? We have the Star of Bethlehem that leads the kind of three wise men to kind of seek out the birth of the Messiah, right? The King of the Jews. The same thing happens with the life of Muhammad. But the thing is, what you can actually do, and uh, if some some uh, observatories that will, uh, even have this today, where they'll have like a little pamphlet around Christmas time about the Star of Bethlehem, and they'll go through like all of the uh, the options they think, or all the candidates they think could have been the Star of Bethlehem, right? And the same thing goes with uh, of the astronomers of the past, like uh, like Al Harazmi and things like that, they were like, well, you know, we have these different dates that are given by traditional scholarship for the birth of Muhammad and his death and things like that. So let's look at the stars and see uh, what the most correct one is. And so they cycle through uh, what the astral way was for this day, for that day, and whatever. And like, oh. Here we have the conjunction of this and that and the other, and so that must be the correct date. All right. So that's kind of uh, in, in a kind of a casual way like how, how they worked. And it's also why they thought they could predict the future as well, 
uh, you know, to varying degrees. It's, it's one. It's it's why kind of astrophysicists think they can predict the future, albeit not the future of say U.S. elections, but they can say, well, there will be a day in which the you know the sun is so large that it consumes the Earth and and all that stuff. Understood. So these these are some some things that I I I would like to ask about when it comes to I guess items that belong to the prophet or mm -hmm. perhaps events that have happened in the prophet's lifetime, which we would maybe hear about from from other sources. Uh, for example, the Muslims travel to Abyssinia mm -hmm. or the prophet's letter to uh, Heraclius. Mm -hmm. uh, in addition to that, there's there, if you go, you know, there's throughout museums in the, in the Muslim world, there's, you know, a lot of artifacts that are said to belong to the Prophet. Now, I, I wonder, do we have any, first of all, uh, do these artifacts actually belong to the Prophet? And for some of these events, do we have evidence from the other places which, I guess, support the the, the Muslim view? Yeah. Um, as far as I'm, as far as I'm concerned, and as far as as I have any knowledge of, of them and uh, of what I've seen in their photographs, we have absolutely no historical artifact like a letter from the Prophet Muhammad or anything like that. Uh, to my mind, these sorts of things can sometimes be very old. Most of them seem like modern forgeries that I that I have seen, but sometimes they can be very old. But a lot of times they date to you know, the medieval period, not anywhere close to kind of late antiquity. I mean. To give kind of a, a parallel to how kind of historians view most of these things, uh, one might cite something like the Shroud of Turin, right? Shroud of Turin is revered by Christians world. If you don't know what the Shroud of Turin is, uh, the Shroud of Turin is basically a burial shroud that has the imprint of the face and the body of the post-mortem crucified Christ. And so, and the idea is that when he resurrected, I guess, light or energy or something shone forth from his body and made an imprint upon the burial shroud. You can see it today. You can look it up online. Right? And if you kind of do carbon dating and you do an historical investigation to the authenticity of the Shroud of Turin, it's not in any way a authentic historical artifact. Uh, but that doesn't mean you don't have very early references to similar things. Like another very similar thing is something called the Mandelian of Edessa. And that is a, a portrait of Jesus or the face of Jesus, right? Uh, and it's associated with the with a uh, a myth about uh, a King Abgar of Edessa that probably died around 1050. And he supposedly exchanged uh, letters with Jesus of Nazareth before his death. And the letter that King Abgar exchanged with Jesus of Nazareth is a very key uh, component of the founding kind of legend of Edessa uh, as a city, as a Christian city. And it appears in all the earliest Christian historiography. It, uh, um, and the letter that Jesus supposedly wrote to him appears, for example, in the history of Eusebius of Caesarea, who lived in the, in the at the end of the third century. Um, but the thing is, there there is no factual evidence of Christianity in in Edessa before the reign of of another Abgar, Abgar the Great, in 150, right? Um, and there's no evidence that. The letter is authentic in any way. It's part, it's a product of later historiography. And in general, most of the letters, all the letters, as far as I can tell, are uh, that are attributed to the, to the Prophet Muhammad are, are like this. There are some exceptions I, I would I would cite to that. And maybe we could add to that list. There is, sort of, for example, a, a tax document detailing how much uh, sadaqah or how much alms one has to pay, depending on how large one's flock is. For example, I think that's very likely authentic. Uh, I think that the, the Uma document, the Constitution of Medina, is very likely authentic and things like that. Uh, but then there's also a wide array of things like hairs from the Prophet Muhammad and uh, his footprints and things like that. I don't think those are in any way historically authentic. Uh, but there's also things that Christians have, like uh, the monks of Mount Sinai, they have this huge... Uh, letter that's supposedly uh, uh, composed by the Prophet Muhammad that is a, is a manifest forgery. It's a manifest forgery, you know, on the scale of the Isidorian decretals or the donation of Constantine. Um, so these are kind of typical things that are documents that are uh, forged for legal purposes, for political purposes, 
uh, if you can imagine if you're monks in the middle of the desert and you want to have some sort of negotiating power with the ruling Muslim power, if you could say, hey, we have this letter from the Prophet Muhammad and he gave us X, Y, Z legal rights, so leave us alone, uh, it would serve their interest to have such a letter. And these sorts of letters were, were widely uh were widely forged, widely recorded, and they're even recorded as forgeries by um, uh, uh, medieval Muslim scholars as well, who testify to their kind of existence. But uh, I, don't, I don't think we can really take them seriously. Now, uh, there is an interesting example that I talk about in the book. Uh, that's the letter that the Prophet Muhammad sends to uh, Heraclius. And it, the wording of the letter is is interesting. Uh, it makes reference to something called, in Arabic it's called Itham al arisin and it's created a lot of problems for Orientalists that try to uh, translate the phrase. Uh, but a lot of the early uh, Muslim scholars that gloss the word actually get it correctly, even though they don't seem to know what the reference is. So uh, Itham means sin, and arisin uh, probably means uh, Tenants, like farmer tenants, like the uh, people that farm land for on behalf of a landowner, an absentee uh, landowner. And so the Prophet Muhammad says to Heraclius in that letter, he says, if you don't you know, embrace my message, uh, you will be subject to the sin of the tenants. And it's like, well, what is that? Uh, what does that mean? And so it seems that uh, it's a reference to uh, a gospel parable that we find in, uh, for example, the Gospel of Matthew, uh, that kind of tells the story of wicked tenants that were punished by God because they did not heed the message of the prophets that he sent, and then finally the Son of God, Jesus. And so they're dispossessed of their land. Uh, and one of the things that's weird about uh, the phrasing, and not only is it strange that we have the reference to the uh, the gospel, uh, that, sorry, that gospel par uh, parable, but also the word that's used for tenants there, aris, is not Arabic. Uh, it's not Syriac. Uh, it's actually uh, uh, another dialect of Aramaic, which Syriac is also a dialect of Aramaic, uh, called Christian Palestinian Aramaic. So it almost certainly comes from uh, Christian Palestine. Uh, and so we're dealing with a very early representation of the text. Uh, if we're not talking about a, uh, a text written by the Prophet Muhammad. So I'm, I'm kind of scheduled that it's written by the Prophet Muhammad himself. But just to add something else that's tantalizing into the mix, uh, one of our earliest accounts of the conquest and of uh, uh, testimonies to uh, the, the Prophet Muhammad and his teachings, this Armenian historian named Suda Sabios, or whom we call Suda Sabios, mentions that a letter was sent to Heraclius. He doesn't attribute it to Muhammad. He attributes to uh, the Ishmaelites, by whom he means the Arabs. Uh, but it, it's a very early text that does mention a letter being sent to Heraclius. Right? So what, what do we do with that? And that you know, I'm not sure. Uh, but it's, it is fascinating. It's, it's tantalizing. I, I mean, I tend to view all those letters as being tropes. Right? So because uh, a letter is sent to the ruler of Egypt, uh, a letter is sent to to Kisra, right? He he famously rips the the letter to shreds, and so as a punishment for ripping the letter to shreds, his uh, empire is ripped to shreds, etc. The travel of the Muslims. Sorry. The, uh, oh, when they're well, traveling, yeah. So we don't really have uh, a lot of evidence per se for them traveling or Muslims traveling that are anywhere near contemporary or things like that. There's tons of evidence for uh, Arabians in general, people that inhabit Arabia or people that are called Arabs by outsiders uh, being mentioned by merchants or engaging in trade, etc. Uh, but the earliest evidence that we have of the trade journeys of, say, the Prophet Muhammad and his followers is actually uh, a chronography of the Bishop of Edessa named Jacob, who's probably writing in the 690s. And he mentions the trade journeys of the Prophet Muhammad. Uh, but it's very interesting because his, the trade journeys of, that he attributes to the Prophet Muhammad are, have a pretty broad ambit. I mean, so he's going, according to Jacob of Edessa, he's traveling much farther than the Syria literature ever portrays him as going. Um, 
And so he has him traveling to Palestine. He has him traveling to Phoenicia, which would be modern day kind of Lebanon and the west coast of Syria. And also uh, he has him traveling to uh, well, what we modern day Syria as well. So kind of doing the usual markets that are associated with kind of Arab traders in general. Theophanes adds to that uh, that uh, this is a whole generation later, full century, if not more, uh, that Muhammad actually traded in Egypt as well. Uh, but, you know, we, we don't have, for example, reports of, of folks saying when, for example, when Amr ibn al conquers Egypt, and, oh, we recognize this guy. We saw him in the markets of Alexandria. And now here he is conquering us. We don't have anything like that, even though we do have very early reports of, of, of Amr being uh, the conqueror of Egypt that are basically contemporary. Understood. And then the, the, the travel to Abyssinia, uh, would we have any records? Nothing as far as I know. I, I mean, it's, that's you know, the, the best evidence that we have for connections to kind of Axum or Abyssinia in general is the appearance of uh, F, what we probably would guess would be vocabulary from Gez, uh, that made its way into Arabic and that the Quran uses, right? So, so we know that there is a lot of influence from Ethiopia, from Aksum, through South Arabia, uh, in terms of evidence for Quraysh going there a lot and things like that. You know, mostly we just have to rely upon the linguistic evidence, you know, that the Quran itself contains. Uh, I don't really think there's. There's much more. There's, there's nothing like an inscription or, 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 we, or in general, when it comes to the history of Aksum and Ethiopia in general, uh, the appearance of uh, texts that uh, or the kind of narrate that history is pretty late unless we're talking about folks like Procopius. So he's writing very far away from events uh, and within the Byzantine historiographical tradition. There's really, really not a lot of hard evidence for that. Understood. Thank you so much for that. I think we're going to shift our focus a little bit towards the study of, of Sir Malazi in, in, in the West. Um, considering, well, first I should ask, what is the current state of, uh, of the study of this of the Sir Malazi literature in the, in the West? I would say it's very sleepy. <laughs> so, I, I don't know, I feel like it's, it's not really being done very much, to be perfectly honest. Um, that's one of the reasons why I kind of wrote the book is as I was as hoping uh, that it could spur on a little bit more work. Um, you know, there was a time period in which you know Hadith kind of got a a much needed kind of shot in the arm uh, through the work of folks like uh, Harold Matsky, Gregor Scholler, uh, Andreas Gerke. Um, but, you know, Harold Mosky's passed away, uh, and we have, you know, some of his students are, are still around, like Ian Shiner and things like that. Um, but in general, I don't think there's a lot of work being done in the West. To be, be perfectly honest, in terms of the work that's being done in the West, it's, it's pretty small. Uh, and I think that in terms of sheer quantity and, and a lot of times the quality, uh, most of the really interesting work is being done uh, in Arabic speaking, Arabophone scholarship. That's where I felt like I read some of the most interesting things when I was kind of doing uh, research for um, for my book and things like that. Um, but yeah, I, I feel like uh, when we get to the most exciting stuff that's going on in the West right now, it's mostly in the Quran, in Quranic studies. And uh, I was also hoping to uh, borrow some of the energy that's in the Quranic studies right now, uh, but also to show that uh, the folks that are interested or potentially interested in in kind of the Sira Mahazi literature, that uh, there's a lot of things that can be done because the Quranic studies folks have made so much progress uh, And uh, on the one hand. And then also beside on the, on the other, other end of things, because uh, a lot of the folks that do epigraphy, like Leila Nami and like Ahmed Al-Jalad and uh, Christian Robin, like there is 
a lot of stuff that can be done uh, now with revisiting the uh, the serial literature again. So, uh, I'm, as many ways as trying to steal a little bit of energy from other kind of subspecialties, specialties and subfields, um, uh, because you know, I, like I said, w- w- uh, one of the most interesting things that was written on the Sira Mahazi literature uh, was unfortunately only posthumously published. So that was by uh, Nishahab Ahmed. He wrote the really wonderful monograph on uh, the Satanic verses, you know. But and it, it's it's hard, you know. How is that going to be followed up? Or are more people going to be writing these things? I hope so. Uh, but uh, nah, it's it's not really widely done. I, I feel like that's not where a lot of the the energy in, in the field is right now, and and hopefully that can, that can change. So I feel like there's a lot of really important work still yet to be done, and I don't want to do it all myself. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. uh, thank you. And and you know this is a very I guess this or on uh, anything about the companions, uh, really anything in early Islamic history um, is is kind of a sensitive topic for many Muslims. So I wonder. Keeping this in mind, I mean, how can Muslim scholars from a traditional background work together with scholars from Western institutions to come to a better understanding of the Prophet's life? And I know, I think that the, the phrasing of that question might be kind of silly because mm-hmm. a traditional Muslim scholar already has a better understanding. I mean, to them, they, there's mm-hmm. already the understanding yeah. of the have, which is far superior. But I mean, do you see any uh, collaboration from your interactions with more traditional Muslim scholars, you know, stuff where... Mm-hmm. They feel they can, there's improvement in how they can kind of work together uh, with scholars training, you know, at the U Chicago or, or in other universities. Yeah, I mean, so I would say that, so I'll, let's, let's put it this way. So my, the type of work that I do uh, would be completely impossible without the work that people like, say, Shoaib Arnaud, rahimahullah, or Albani, rahimahullah, like all these people have done before I even picked up my first Arabic book. What kind of Ahl Hadith folks are currently doing in institutions in, say, Saudi and elsewhere? Um, they, that those institutions, that tradition is gi- is gigantic, is self-sustaining, and Basically, what the Western Academy does is mostly parasitic, almost entirely, on their work, right? It, it, the type of stuff that we do is is virtually impossible without sort of the, the philological spade work, the manuscript editing, the kind of the kind of the tahrij studies and stuff that we are doing in the Western Academy. Unthinkable with what they did. We're long gone from the days in which someone like you know a uh, a Dehoya would discover the manuscripts of Tabari's Tariq and be the one to publish them, right? If if we found something like Tabari's Tariq uh, in like a European library somewhere, uh, I feel like the way that the Western Academy feels about philology nowadays, God help us, it would never get done, right? Uh, we're almost, in, unfortunately, wholly reliable uh, to, and totally reliable on the work that's being done in the Muslim world and, and places, especially places like you know Iran and Saudi and Turkey and, and things like that, uh, even though the flames of philology are, are not totally dead yet in the Western world. In terms of scale, I mean, I think our work is is absolutely dwarfed. And and for the most part, you know, we have, remember that Islamic studies in Western institutions and the study of Arabic and Islamic history is a marginal field. It's, it's not an important field that you see institutions kind of pouring money into. They're very happy to uh, receive money from private donors. Please call my university, Ohio State University, if you're, if you're rich and you're interested in doing so, uh, to support our work. But but in general, like it, massive resources are, are not poured into this type of work for the most part. Uh, so we re- we need Muslim scholarship to be done. If, if Muslim scholarship is not flourishing, and it's uh, traditionalist or otherwise, uh, outside Western institutions, then it's, then a lot of our stuff just is not happening, at least in in the way that uh, at least this, the way that I kind of do work, but mostly philological approaches to history and, and things like that. Uh, and I think that that probably should be acknowledged more uh, from from Western scholars. I don't think it's a, acknowledged uh, as much as it as it ought to be and I 
I don't see my stuff as necessarily participating in that same discourse. I hope that, uh, uh, you know, scholars that work from more of the seminarian background or the traditionalist frameworks find my work useful. Uh, but I see myself as mainly working as a as a humanist, you know, as as contributing to not like, a lot of times I tell my students I, I don't study Muslims, right? I study Islamic society in order to learn about human beings, right? I study us, and this is the slice of us that that I study. It's a humanistic enterprise. It's not kind of in the service of say an identity or uh, or or a tradition. Uh, besides the humanistic, secular, or Western academic tradition, I guess insofar as it is so coherent. Understood. And and just briefly, I mean, where, where does the field go from here? Mm. So one of the things I think that, that it could do better, and which I hope future work will do, is to better understand and grasp the chronological kind of unfurling of the early historiographic tradition. And so what do I mean by that? I think the way that a lot of people are currently treating Arabic texts that read them, they look at these big Hadith compilations and they view them in a very kind of one-dimensional way. They see them just like flat on the paper. What I would like for them to do is to begin to see them uh, a bit more three-dimensionally. So I want them to see, understand that, you know, Zuhri represents a moment in the tradition. Ibn Ishaq uh, represents a moment in the tradition. And al Waqadi represents a moment in the tradition and understand it kind of chronologically like that. Uh, but also instead uh, having a kind of a robust kind of vertical chronological study of, of these works is important. But I would like to add another dimension to that. And that is I want them to read more comparatively. And I think that there is a, a strength of say uh, of the way in which work is done in predominantly kind of Western academy versus how it's done in the traditional academy is is the lateral approaches right the types of insights that you get when you read syriac historiography alongside the syria right to do things that uh, that take you outside the silo of the tradition right i think sometimes the, the tradition is so massive it's so large it's and it's so rich that sometimes you get a false sense of breadth uh, by uh, by mastering this kind of large corpus, but you don't really have breadth when you only work with the Arabic material. You only have a depth in one type of material. And I would like to add more breadth. I would like people to take the Syriac sources more seriously. I like them to take the Greek sources more seriously. I would like them to take the sources that are in the Arabian Peninsula but are not written in the Arabic language, be they Safaitic, be they Gez, be they epigraphic South Arabian, and you you name it, right? Uh, so I, I would like to see uh, kind of this broadening of the field uh, uh, happen. It, it, that takes a lot of work, of course, and that's why it reasons it's daunting. A lot of people feel intimidated by that. Uh, but I would like to see this sort of uh, this breadth uh, brought to it as well. And I, I would like people just to read, <laughs> read a lot of Arabic, read bunches of Arabic. I feel like sometimes, uh, particularly in the, er the age of the database, uh, people find things in a database. But they don't have the experience of like what happens if you read that tradition that you found in that database or that passage that you found in the database and you turn the page. <laughs> a lot of times, there's a lot of things you you feel like people didn't just turn the next page and uh, and read what else was going on. Thank you so much, and 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 I, and I think those are manageable manageable goals uh, for the future. We're about to conclude, and and I think this is probably one of the questions that I I guess somewhat hesitate to ask, but I think I'll ask it anyway. There's an individual who achieved a certain amount of success, and Muslims attribute that success to the fact that he's a prophet, uh, someone beloved by God. Uh, there's a lot of divine intervention. So, I mean, keeping all, all this in mind, how do you explain this success from, from I guess, a more secular uh, point of view? Mm. And that's the first part of the question. And, and the second part of this question is, uh, well, I guess to, to, to kind of put that question in, in a nutshell, it's pretty much how does the Orientalist version of the Prophet differ from the version that Muslims hold? And the second part of the question is, based on your studies, and of course you've studied quite a lot, what impresses you about the Prophet as an individual? Yeah, so I mean, we can take it from there. Okay. Um, 
So, you know, it's, <laughs> one of the things that's very difficult about explaining successes and why some movements succeed and some don't um, is, well, you know, I, well, I guess maybe it's, that's maybe not that's maybe not actually the point of the question. Actually, I, I think part of the question that's being asked, if I understand it correctly, is um, does the actual success of uh, Islam, uh, the Quran, and uh, the, the kind of the uh, the long legacy of uh, the Prophet Muhammad's preaching sort of confirm in some way its veracity? Like how how could it not be true when it's so successful or something like that? Uh, so I, that's that's a that's something that Muslims themselves uh, I may mean, thought. And so a lot of times I've asked myself if I was uh, you know there's a, a figure of not exceptional piety. You know, but I lived during the time of the Prophet Muhammad, and I was one of his people. If I was like a member of Quraysh, and I could remember him before his political successes, and then I witnessed his political success in the context of Arabia, and then I also witnessed and participated in this kind of this massive success of the conquest. Uh, what I mean, I could probably just couldn't help but to be utterly God stopped by what happened. Right? Like, how could God not be behind it? And, and many times we get these uh, these views actually expressed. Uh, it, this is a sort of view in, in history a lot of times we call triumphalism, right? It must be true because we're so successful. I think this is something that is a, a moralizing view of history uh, that I would caution against any historian uh, embracing. Uh, just for the simple fact that, you know, it's it can be easily embraced and abused by many different parties, right? Uh, one could take, for example, Joseph Smith and the rise of Mormonism and the spread of Mormonism to a faith of many millions, probably uh, the in, probably in sheer numbers, Mormonism probably grew faster than Islam has, and, and Mormonism is just getting started. Who knows what it's going to look like? in a thousand years. So you could always be outdone by someone that comes after you, for example. Uh, and then there's also the danger uh, that particularly like Americans uh, face or like the Romans face, like, like the reason why we are in power and the reason why uh, we have beaten all other nations is not because we're more vicious than anybody else, it's because we're better, right? We, we, there's something good about us. That's something you should always be kind of skeptical of. Uh, that doesn't mean that there was no goodness in, in what happened or anything like that. Uh, I mean, one of the extraordinary things about uh, the success of the Prophet Muhammad, and you get, you get this mentioned in the writings of Maimonides, or Ibn Maymun in Arabic, one of the, the most important scholars of uh, medieval Jewish thought, probably the most important scholar of medieval Jewish thought. When he looked at the, the legacy of the Prophet Muhammad, he's, he himself, even though he was uh, uh, a man of Jewish faith, right, deep Jewish faith, he saw God's hand, God's providential hand, and uh, spreading monotheism as opposed to you know, paganism, polytheism, through the message of Muhammad. A lot of early uh, pious Christians saw the same thing. They saw that basically uh, God was using Islam as a way to civilize the Arabs and to prepare them to become Christians eventually. And, and they're very <laughs> optimistic view, of course, uh, that didn't happen. Uh, but I, of course, how do we explain that success? You know, we could go on in, in about like, well, it was successful for this reason and that reason. It's 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 hard to give an explanation uh, that is not reductive uh, from a purely historical perspective. That I don't think will be emotionally satisfying uh, to believers, and I think in some sense is inevitably intellectually not satisfying either because there you will kind of leave something out. So for example, I said, oh, the Islamic conquests were successful because there was a huge war between the Byzantines and the Sassanids, the Romans and the Persians, right before the Islamic conquest. And, you know, their armies were decimated. They were totally exhausted. And the Arabs had a lot of manpower and that's why they were able to be so successful. No, no divine intervention needed right 
I'm not satisfied with that explanation. I think many people wouldn't be either. That definitely can explain some part of the success. Um, and then what's the difference between the Orientalist version of Muhammad and the Muhammad of faith? Well, I mean, it, it depends on the Orientalist, of course. There are many or Muslims who I consider to be Orientalists. It depends on what, how you use the word. To me, an Orientalist is someone that practices philology of Oriental languages. Uh, you know, you have <laughs> some people that have very nasty views of Muhammad, some people that have overwhelmingly ad admiring views of the Prophet Muhammad. Um, you know, they, I mean, you have them across the board. So, and same thing with, with Muslim views of of the Prophet Muhammad. If you go from, you know, Shiites, the Sufis, the Sunnis, I mean, it's, there are very, very many Muhammads. I mean, Kisha Ali has a wonderful book called The Lives of Muhammad in which she kind of explores the different ways in which Muhammad kind of is a site in which people kind of debate issues that are not really just about Muhammad, but also about their own identities and modernity, all sorts of things. Uh, I kind of really recommend that. It's, it's hard to kind of, again, reduce that. And I guess I'll, and then the last one, what impresses me personally about uh, the Prophet Muhammad, I mean, the thing that, that I come to a lot is the way in which uh, the Quran, uh, usually when I think about the Prophet Muhammad, really I think about the Quran. So how the Quran uh, was able to take an obscure, unknown language uh, that would otherwise have been forgotten by history and to create one of, kind of the most powerful, uh, you know, cultures of, of historical change and literatures of historical change that the world has ever seen. I mean, I think uh, the only thing that you could compare kind of Arabic literary culture and the religion kind of, of Islam to in terms of a force of historical change would be something like Hellenism. I mean, it uh, that it just from the, uh, the beauty of the message and the beauty of its composition, uh, to be able to kind of achieve that and sure it had a lot of help with uh, uh, some state building and some uh, kind of martial exertion uh, but you know we don't talk about the equivalent of the Quran for Genghis Khan right so the fact that we uh, are still kind of reading Arabic and Arabic literature and also or all this other stuff is probably the thing that impresses me the most uh, I mean one of the greatest gifts I feel like I've ever had given to me in my life is uh, sort of uh, from my advisor, Wadad al-Qadi, and how kind of she taught me. She really taught me how to read Arabic literature uh, and particularly the classical sources. And kind of when I'm alone uh, in my office or just sitting down and reading kind of this amazing corpus, I feel like, you know, a truly, truly happy person, truly blessed person. And none of that would have happened without the Quran and the message of Muhammad. So I guess that's probably the thing that impresses me the most about him. Understood. Thank you so much for that. I, I hesitated to ask. I mean, there's, just a, there's different epistemologies here. Yeah. Um, and so the question I thought, and then, of course, I, I wouldn't have asked you the question. I don't know you personally, but I know you through, you know, some of your writings and through your Twitter. So I thought, you know, it, it makes sense to ask you this question. Yeah. Um, but, you know, thank you so very much, uh, Professor, for being um on the uh, on this episode and giving me two hours of your time it's a very very insightful uh conversation and i think it'll be very beneficial for anybody who's very interested in 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 studying uh the i guess the historic muhammad um is there anything do you have in in the works uh, anything that you have i mean you know you have a book that you just published uh but besides that so um i have two things that i worked on so uh Along with Stephen Shoemaker, uh, we translated a, uh, when it, basically an eyewitness account of the Persian conquest of Jerusalem that happened right before the Islamic conquest. It survives in, it was originally written in Greek, but the Greek doesn't survive. It only survives in Old Georgian and in Christian Arabic. And so I translated the Christian Arabic. He translated the Georgian version. That'll be coming out. And also I just finished up uh, a new edition of the Arabic and a English translation of the Sirat Omar ibn Abdul Aziz for the, uh, by Ibn Abdul Hakim. So that's a very early biography of uh, the Umayyad Caliph Omar ibn Abdul Aziz, sometimes called the fifth rightly guided caliph by an early Egyptian Maliki scholar named, uh, named Abdullah ibn Abdul Hakim. So those are the two big projects 
that will be coming up hopefully in the next two years or so. Uh, so with that, I'd like to conclude the podcast. Thank you so much again, Professor. All right, and, thank you uh, so much.